Okay, so I want to, I'm, I'm hoping that my presentation will touch on a range of things that will resonate throughout um, the next day and a half. Um, but in particular, I want to be talking about uh, feelings and emotions and politics. And this is a more theoretical piece of work, but it, it emerged out of uh, some work I did with Mary Holmes uh, in 2010, in the lead up to the general election. Um, we travelled around parts of, parts of the north talking to working class people about politics and what they thought about politics. And this became a project about dis disengagement and dissatisfaction amongst these groups. And in amongst doing that work, the people that we spoke to hinted at the way feelings um, of affinity, particularly it's a lack of affinity, were important in the ways in which they disconnected, if you like, with, with politicians and mainstream politics in general. Um, so the sorts of things that they hinted at were a manner of speaking. So um, at the time, and I'd say this has changed quite considerably since then, but uh, Nick Clegg's plain speaking was seen as um, refreshing uh, and was often contrasted with uh, people like Brown, who was seen as uh, you know, supposedly being for Labour, but really talking down to people and being a bit condescending. But communication was, was a big thing. Um, shared locality, uh, this was, most of this work was done in Yorkshire, um, and that might be, so these findings might be unique to Yorkshire, but uh, uh, politicians who were from Yorkshire were, were viewed very favourably as well. Um, so, you know, having some sort of something in common with these people. Um, and in terms of a lack of affinity, the socio-economic divide between politicians and citizens was commented upon again and again. Um, so I've got some little quotes here. These are both about David Cameron. Um, this is not supposed to be sort of representative of the argument. It just gives you a little flavour. So Doreen says, oh, well, he's, a, he's snooty him. He'll not be really interested in ordinary, what I class as ordinary people. Uh, and Mick says, take David Cameron for instance, you know, he, he weren't just born with a silver spoon in his mouth, he had the whole damn cutlery tray in his mouth. <laughs> you know what I mean? How can that guy, how can that guy, you know, represent me? He can't, it's impossible. So that, that's the sort of flavour of the kinds of things that we're coming up against. Um, and from these little um, skerricks of information, if you like, we began to think about how um, feelings, and in particular a, a lack of affinity, might be important in, in the way in which people relate to politics and politicians. So this is more of a, an attempt to sketch out that idea rather than support it with empirical work, because we only got bits and pieces, but it got us thinking about the idea, if you like. Um, and it's interesting because emotions feature regularly in public debate about politics and we're used to thinking about how citizens respond uh, emotionally to politics but there's, as I'll, you know, I'll mention later, but there's not so much on, uh, from social science about uh, how citizens respond emotionally to, to politics. So of course there's lots of examples um, and these are mostly the ones that I describe in the paper but uh, Obama's 08 campaign motif of hope you know, is a very good example of an emotion in politics. Um, in this country, the uh, MP's expenses scandal was a good example of feelings of disgust and outrage um, at the way uh, our representatives had behaved. And the sun snouts out of order. Isn't that? I just think that's great. Um, but you can go through and see how your representative had been abusing public funds, if you like. Uh, and this is, a, um, this is a poster that would ma was made by the BBC One show, so mainstream journalism, this is not sort of crazy lefties, uh, and it says, will members kindly not claim for moat cleaning, piles of manure, adult films, duck houses, non-existent mortgages, or anything else you shouldn't? Thank you. So you get this very strong sense, I mean this is a product of the media obviously, but you get a strong sense um, of the outrage that people felt um, due to the, the violation of common sense rules. You know, these were things that people should not, obviously should not have been claiming for, and they were, um, and it you know, provoked a lot of strong feelings. Here's some 
angry protesters at the Chilcot inquiry, um, as we were talking about last night, you know, people still, you know, 10 years on, angry about Blair and the actions around Iraq and Afghanistan. At the other end of the, the spectrum, uh, I had to include these because these images are just amazing. There's some fantastic photos of Tahrir Square in Egypt from 2011. Um, and obviously a range of emotions were displayed, excitement, joy, elation, if you like. Um, and I put this one up because this is a shot uh, from the evening of Tahrir Square. This is two days before Mubarak um, stood down and protesters were, have been reported to have been chanting, we're almost there, we're almost there. So you get these feelings of solidarity, if you like. It's Tahrir Square, it's the same, it's Egypt. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, right. yeah. And in my home country of Australia, the uh, national apology to the, um, uh, Australia's indigenous populations is a, a really good example of another kind of emotion in public life and politics. Was that part of it? Sorry? Writing in the sky, was that? It was actually before the national apology, that, that writing, uh, because uh, I think it was uh, like a private businessman who paid for the plane to... So the backstory to the apology was that we had a Prime Minister for uh, you know, over a decade who refused to say sorry. Um, and you know, this became a, an ongoing uh, political issue. So when it finally did happen, uh, it was obviously very significant in and of itself, but also because of the backstory, if you like. This, you know, finally we've... We've got there. So this is just some, uh, some coverage of the day in national newspapers. Uh, and again, a range of emotions. So at the top, you know, feelings of sorrow and sadness, uh, you know, a bit more joy and, and happiness. And perhaps, you know, with the Black Power salute, some, some strength and some victory maybe. So I think we're quite comfortable with thinking about emotions and you know, citizens responding emotionally um, to politics at a popular level, but this is largely ignored in sociology uh, in particular, in social science more generally. There is a bit of work um, within political science, but, um, but not much in the sociology of emotions. So the idea was uh, to think about how emotions, particularly feelings of affinity and, as I said, more often a lack of affinity, um, the role that they've come to play as being increasingly important in people's deliberations and disengagement um, with an electoral politics no longer organised by social class. So I'll, I'll flesh that out a bit for you, but that's kind of the nub of the idea, if you like. So there's quite a few ideas in play, so I've come up with a, a clever graphic to um, distract you. <laughs> uh, so, might affinity have some sort of a role in, in people's connections with politics and politicians? So, the first thing I think that's significant is the extension of the franchise. So, with the extension of the franchise, very slowly, it takes some time, but we do begin to see people entering poli political life and politics from uh, working class backgrounds you know, ordinary people, if you like, with direct connection to, to working life. We go through a period where vote and class are aligned. Um, and, yeah. That period comes to an end, um, so I'll talk about each of these in a bit more detail in a minute, but that period comes to an end as, uh, in particular, new social movements uh, begin to displace class as a central identity for, for politics, if you like. So the women's movement, gay liberation, black power. Your class becomes one of a number of identities that's important in politics. Uh, Emotionalised reflexivity, you can discuss that in a bit more detail later. We also have a range of processes which put um, an increasing emphasis on individual politicians, so the personalisation of politics celebrity politicians, these sorts of things. We're used to thinking about individuals, perhaps less than, than parties. At the same time, we have a de decline of party membership and disconnection of mainstream parties from a grassroots base, if you like. 
And we also know that politicians come from a narrow professional and educational elite, which sort of separates them again from, from the bulk of the population, if you like. And we also know that we have a, a context, particularly in Britain, of disengagement and dissatisfaction with electoral politics, which underscores the fact that most of the time it's a lack of affinity that we're talking about rather than people actually connecting with politicians. So the extension of the franchise, um, you know, obviously this is a, a complex history, but with the extension of the franchise you do slowly begin to have uh, a sense of egalitarianism entering into public life. Um, and of course this took much longer for, the extension of the franchise took much longer for women and indigenous peoples and it's important to note. Um, but with labour movements you, you do gradually begin to see working people entering politics and this move from perhaps an aristocratic ruling elite to you know, having some, um, some members of parliament connected to ordinary, ordinary life and, and, and with direct experience of working life. So by 1945 almost a third of British Labour MPs had been manual labourers before they, they'd entered Parliament and in a Parliament of you know, 600, 650 members there are 108 of them. That's a pretty significant you know, group of people if you like. And it's also important to note that at this time um, parties had large membership bases and they had, you know, certainly relative to now, in an active grassroots base. You know, people were connected to parties. I'm certainly not trying to idealise or say that these are golden times, but um, they, have, they have changed. So um, the period that in which class and vote are um, closely aligned in social theory is variously described as organised or Beck calls it simple modernity if you like. Um, and we have a range of processes of conventionalisation, homogenisation. You can see these in different parts of society. So Taylorist and Fordist modes of production, if you like. And in political life, we have mass political parties which um, organise and, and direct and channel political behaviour, if you like. And of course, class and vote are, are closely aligned. This begins to break down to some extent. Um, if you like, this, the alignment of class and vote. Um, and we enter uh, what's described in a, in a range of different ways as post or late um, or liquid modernity. And what I think is significant for the idea, for, for the idea of affinity, is the shift towards reflexivity. So for Ulrich Beck, uh, society begins to produce new manufactured risks of, of itself. Society produces these itself rather than, say, uh, natural disasters, if you like. Um, and society needs to, to respond reflexively to these as new threats emerge. So environmental catastrophe would be a good one. Um, but at a more everyday kind of social level, um, traditional uh, relations between class and gender and ethnicity, these begin to change. Um, and traditional ways of doing and being become unsettled, if you like and we can rely on routine action a little bit less than we did in the past as the general sort of thrust of the idea. And then of course new social movements, so as I mentioned before um, you know, gay, gay and lesbian movement, women's movement, uh, black power, these challenge the centrality of, of a class identity for politics and at the same time begin to uh, question the, the meaning and the nature of politics you know, with a, with a critique of the public-private divide. Um, you know, and the classic phrase from the feminist period of, you know, the person who is political. So politics itself is, is challenged, if you like. Um, now, I, it's important to note that I don't follow Beck all the way with this. Um, you know, I certainly don't think that class is a zombie category. Uh, we were talking about zombies last night. Um, you know, I don't think this is uh, a social form that is dead but continues to live. You know, I think class does have social relevance and you know, cultural and social meaning for people. Um, but it, I don't think it organises politics in the way that it did previously. Um, parties no longer make class-based appeals. 
and class doesn't really feature in the language of politics either. I was thinking about this recently. If you wanted to vote along class lines, you'd have you know, quite a task of interpreting the parties to do, uh, certainly the, 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 the major parties. Um, But the, the model of reflexivity that um, is dominant within social sciences from uh, theorists like Beck and Giddens um, puts forward a, a cognitive monitoring, calculating um, model of, of reflexivity. And emotions are, are largely ignored in this process um, and they're, they're overlooked. Um, but of course, uh, particularly Mary Holmes, the co-author, we, we, we both think that emotions are important in, you know, when we're determining how to act in perhaps new circumstances where routine action can't and habit can't be followed anymore. Uh, we feel our way through these things. Uh, so emotions are, are, are important in making decisions and deliberating about how to act. Um, and, you know, this is about how emotion infuses our perception of the world, others and ourselves. Emotion's an important part of the process. So thinking about affinity, this is about how feelings of affinity, more often it's lack, seep into the gap left by the decline of a politics organised by social class, if you like, that's kind of the, the nub of things. So thinking about the emphasis on individual um, politicians, the private lives of politicians have become politicised. You know, various theorists bemoan the, the lack of a public sphere, you know, um, public life is colonised by the lives of, of private individuals. Um, I've got a clip from Blair later, we can relive some of the Blair days. Um, within political science there's, um, there's a notion that there's been a presidentialization of politics, so um, that political leaders have gained autonomy and power within parties, but also within government as well. So, you know, this emphasises individual politicians as well. And, of course, uh, the notion of celebrity politicians. So this is a quote from David Cameron before he was elected, uh, and he's defending the decision to allow the media access to his family. And he says, I'm asking people a very big thing, which is to elect me as their prime minister. And I think people have a right to know, that's his emphasis, a bit more about you, your life and your family, what makes you tick, and what informs your thinking? And to me, nothing informs my, my thinking more than my family. So, you know, he thinks his private life is really important for, for individual voters. And I've got a little clip here. Let me just minimise this. And we'll edit this out. It'll be seamless. Um, 107. They now close past political broadcast on behalf of the Labour Party. And, and hope that your humanity sees you through it and in the end understand why you want it. Because my dad was very active, I mean, he was active in uh, Tory politics actually locally. In fact, they had him lined up to fight it. To fight a season of government and then he became very ill, so it really gave up that. But we, we discussed it, and then when I started reading it later, it was a slight problem for a time. You never really objected to it because you've come over there by now, so it's all fine. I think my generation is trying to get to a different type of politics, which is rooted in strong values and convictions, but it's not quite left and right in the way that it's been before. I, I just think that for a whole generation of people, they thought that, that if they arrived and did well, then, then you became a Tory. You know, it's like people used to say, when you bought your house, you own your own home, you're a Tory. It's just crazy to say. I've always understood, because of that, why some people who have done very well, who have come up in life and made it on their own, felt the Tory party was the party that was for them, because it was the party of ambition and aspiration. Right. And the Labour Party somehow wasn't. And I think, to an extent, I mean, that's what the Labour Party became. It became too stuck in the past, too rooted and say, well, that's where you are, that's where you stay. Whereas 
think today the position's changed around what Wild Wars want to do today's labor party is to be the part of that aspiration, but say, you know, you can you can have a society where there's ambition without a lack of compassion. Yeah. Because I think that in the end, you, you actually fulfill your ambitions. I think you fulfill your ambitions better in a society where people have some sense of duty towards other people. Oh, man. You have a lot of that on the Anyway, you can wait for the day when it gets on here. You can do a lot of homework. <laughs> Because they keep you ground, because you're seeing all through them and through their friends and what's actually happened. I was thinking, I wanted to be good. First thing to solve. And with all the time, just go back to understanding what you're there, what you want to, to be able to understand. Alright, that's probably enough of him. So, I mean, you know. His son's there, he's discussing homework, he's making tea. You know, it's a domestic kind of scene. Um, we're getting a glimpse into his life. But most of this work um, concentrates on political actors or, you know, we might be looking at the media and we look at the kind of information that citizens receive. But in broad terms, citizens are kind of overlooked. We don't pay much attention to how citizens interpret this kind of, these kinds of changes within politics, if you like, in society. And this is where I think affinity might be a useful way in. So affinity may act as a, an interpretive lens through which leaders, politicians and parties are read. Um, and in more individualised politics, the demand for politicians to show an understanding of everyday life is, is very present. Um, affinity helps to highlight the, the critical engagement that people um, have for politics um, and you know, showing some sort of judgment of, of politicians. And this applies whether they vote or not. Um, you know, this is probably something we're all quite familiar with, but disengagement doesn't necessarily mean that you're apathetic. Um, and if you're paying attention to feelings of a lack of affinity, this comes through you know, quite clearly. Um, in fact, you know, lots of different research, particularly with young people, shows that disengagement can arise out of actual engagement. You know, people get disillusioned once they've stepped in and you know, tried their hand at, at participation, if you like, or politics. Um, so the idea of affinity is not dissimilar to identifying with politicians like, like yourself, which is something that you know, comes out in the literature you know, quite some time ago, 1950s, with Adorno. Um, and it's a liking based on likeness, which of course is easier with a shared social position, but a shared social position or identity is not necessary. Um, affinity and identity are not the same thing. And it's noteworthy that this demand for a, a connection to everyday life is, is particularly strong with, when the party system, you know, is disconnected from citizens, if you like. You know, we, we, we have dwindling membership of political parties and they don't have an active grassroots base anymore. And significantly, um, the elite, narrow and professional backgrounds of politicians mean that these connections with everyday life have to be performed. You know, more often than not, these are, these are not um, you know, the, the connections that they display for popular culture and these sorts of things are, are you know, they're fabricated. This is a performance. Um, and lots of the, 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 the identification that does go on tends to be superficial as well, you know, being a parent or being a wife or, you know, perhaps being a taxpayer. Now, of course, there's lots of ways in which we can say that um, parliamentarians uh, don't represent the population at large, but occupations and uh, educational backgrounds are, are good examples. We'll hear more this afternoon um, from my interview with Simon Woolley about how parliament you know, doesn't represent black and, and ethnic minority groups as well. Um, but here's just a little snapshot from 1979 to 2005. It's actually 2010. See if we can move that over a bit. Ooh, ooh, maybe it's been chopped off. Anyway, um, you can see that 
the professions remain very important you know, as an occupational background for MPs. Business is, is fairly steady, doesn't really change a great deal. Um, but what has increased is this miscellaneous group um, going up from 17 to 35%, so white collar, you know, coming from a political background to start with. And uh, you know, as we would expect, uh, manual labour is sort of drops, drops right away, it ends up at 4% by 2002. And <coughs> the educational background um, is a similar kind of story. So 35% of MPs elected in 2010 uh, attended independent schools which educate just 7% of the population. So you get to see this narrow base. Uh, you, it's been chopped off. Um, and I'm not sure exactly why, but... 63% um, of MPs attend, attended elite universities and of those, a third of them were from Oxbridge um, and of all MPs, 90% went to university. So, yeah, I mean, I probably don't need to labour the point, but this is an elite, uh, an elite group. Um, now, I'm particularly interested in the way in which citizens use feelings and, and affinity and a lack of affinity to interpret and engage with politicians. But of course, politicians use this as well. We saw that with Tony Blair, you know, making tea and discussing homework and things. Um, and what they usually need to do is balance some kind of eminence of the office, if you like, with the demand for affinity and the connection to everyday life. Um, and usually this doesn't work and this comes off as phony and fake um, and people dismiss it pretty quickly, if you like. And there, there's a range of things which politicians do. They profess an interest in popular culture, they attend you know, major sporting events, they say that they support particular teams. Um, as we saw domestic portrayals, you know, positioning themselves as a husband or a wife or a parent, uh, these kinds of things. Uh, in Australia, um, I thought this, this might be an interesting example for you. It um, be interesting to see if this is replicated elsewhere. But Australia has a very strong egalitarian mythology, if you like, and the land of the fair go. Everybody gets a fair go. Um, so these are a series of um, three prime ministers and an opposition leader in the bottom right-hand corner, um, men and women from both sides of politics. and they typically ride in the front seat of chauffeured vehicles. So to be seen sitting in the back seat would be you know, inappropriate. That just wouldn't be fitting with the sort of egalitarian spirit. So you can't quite see it here, but Julia Gillard, um, there, there's a big headrest behind there, so I'm assuming that is her sitting in the front seat. This is Kevin Rudd. Uh, the car's got a little flag on it, so he's just stepping out of the car. Um, former Conservative Prime Minister John Howard um, with his <laughs> The boos and hisses, um, with the rear vision mirror there, so you know further. And you can't see the headrest, but there's a headrest. And hopefully a man who you won't hear very much of in the future. This is Tony Abbott, um, who will be contesting. He's the current leader of the Conservative opposition, contesting the election uh, later in the year, sitting in the front seat. So, you know, fairly superficial kinds of examples, but uh, it does capture something about uh, how Australians see themselves. But thinking about citizens, um, I mean, firstly, there's a, there's a lack of data on this. Uh, even in our work, we got little snippets of information, um, but we didn't get a great deal. Um, but as, as I mentioned earlier, um, we're usually talking about a lack of affinity um, rather than people actually finding connections with, with politicians. Um, and probably the best example of a lack of affinity in this country in the last few years was the MPs expenses scandal um, and we I talked about this before but you know feelings of anger and disgust and the moral outrage that this provoked and particularly at the the socio-economic um, divide and the double standards you know people were upset that they're held to these sorts of um, standards and politicians saw fit to to violate them if you like so these are a couple of um, excerpts from the work I did with Mary Holmes. Uh, so Tom says, well, expenses is one thing, but daylight robbery is another, you know. 
Uh, and John says, one woman MP, she had to pay £45,000 back. I mean, that's twice what I earn in a year. I mean, it's the amount of money that was involved, you know. When people, there's other people, I mean, I'm on 20 odd thousand a year, but there's other people who are struggling along on 12,000 a year, you know, and they can't afford to do anything, and then somebody's claiming for a floating duck house and a moat to be cleaned. You know, so you, you, the sense of inequality comes through very strongly. Now, just quickly, I wouldn't want to suggest that uh, the way we engage with politics is all about affinity, that this is the only thing that's important. Of course, the economy is important, policy, demographics will be important at different times, the media, you know, times of war, we know that incumbents <coughs> tend to do well. Uh, a little quote from the 1992 Clinton campaign, it's, it's the economy, stupid, you know. So obviously, these sorts of things retain relevance as well, but I think that these feelings of affinity might be part <coughs> of how these things are read. And, of course, we know that um, there are alternatives to, to strategies of affinity. Politicians don't just put themselves in domestic settings and present themselves <coughs> as husbands and wives. There's appeals to imagined communities, both on the left and the right. Uh, there's clientelism. Here in Bradford there's been reports of clan politics or baradery, um, which perhaps has been broken down and perhaps changed electoral dynamics. Um, and I've got a little clip from Julia Gillard, which uh, is quite interesting. Um, she, she actually challenges um, this idea of, of affinity and, and politicians um, experientially reflecting the electorate, if you like. Ah, reset. I did have it all queued up, but it, it went away. Hopefully this won't take long. Maybe you can send your alert or video questions to our website, address it on the screen. The next question tonight comes from the audience. It's the mini hat. Some of the Australians think you have low family, so you will not really understand their concerns. Uh, my question is, how will you persuade these people to believe that their worries, their worries are worth mentioning? Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, and thank you for asking the question, because I think it's a question on a lot of people's minds, but sometimes people think they shouldn't ask questions about you know, personal You get the idea. She, she um, clearly rejects this idea and she talks about um, her ability to craft policy that would be relevant for the Australian people and her skills as a politician to, to make policy and, and lead people. So to wrap up, um, Affinity can be used to form points of connection and departure between citizens and politicians, but this only occurs within a context in which uh, the collectivist identities have been seriously undermined. It becomes very hard to see uh, inequalities that, that cut across. You know, 
I mean, it's very hard to articulate um, a class-based notion of inequality, if you like. But affinity, you know, helps us see the critical work of citizens, whether they vote or not. Um, but of course, it's unlikely to challenge um, established power relations. So, you know, perhaps it's not the most useful technique for change. Um, but it does help us shift the focus onto politicians and demand that they meaningfully connect with citizens rather than blaming dysfunctional communities or citizens for being atomized and disconnected and apathetic, if you like. Um, and of course, it helps us challenge common sense ideas between the division of emotion and politics and perhaps the role that emotion might play in politics. Um, you know, we would argue that emotions are part of reflexivity and deliberation and agency. They're an important, have an important role to play. They're not, they're not uh, at opposite ends of the scale, if you like. And I think, you know, as we saw in some of the pictures at the beginning, that a wide range of emotions are part of people's engagements and disengagements with politics. Um, and they deserve some, some sustained scholarly investigation. Thank you. <laughs>